So the title of my talk is um, using, actually, is that the title of my talk? Well, using hip hop as, as, as transformative pedagogy, utilizing hip hop pedagogy to develop science genius. So I'm gonna talk about my framework for hip hop pedagogy. Um, I'm gonna talk about it as a framework and all the examples I'm gonna use are gonna be science examples, STEM examples, because I, I, I came up with this framework while I was teaching my sixth grade science students in the Bronx. Um, so a little bit of background about myself. Grew up in the Bronx, born and raised in the Bronx, went to public schools, K through college, undergrad. Um, and I hated school, you know, like a lot of young students that I taught, I just didn't feel a connection to schooling. Um, and in a sense, kind of felt pushed out of schools. Um, but I met an amazing mentor when I got to high school who utilized hip hop as, a, as an approach to teach um, science in particular. And, you know, that's kind of what got me hooked into like being a more partic participating more in schooling and also kind of like finding my love and my, and my niche um, for the sciences. So I, I graduated from high school and I, I got a degree in biochemistry from undergrad and graduate honors. And at the time I wanted to be a pharmacist. Um, and I just loved uh, just the idea of drugs and the, the drug interactions and things like that. But that's not what my heart was. You know, I thought my heart was going back to my community and trying to inspire more people who look like me, who come from the same backgrounds as I, as I came from, to kind of be inspired to know that, you know, if you wanted to do STEM or pursue a career in STEM, that you could. Um, and that's kind of what led me on this path to getting a doctorate and, um, and being an, a, a STEM educator. Um, so please indulge, um, if you will. And if you have questions, please feel free to, um, you know, use the, the chat function and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, and I'll field those for you as they come in, if, if that's what you would prefer. Either or, yeah, that, that works. So I kind of have, I don't know, I have a kind of an interactive part to start um, today. Um, and, and this is just a, this is an image. Um, uh, and I just want people just to chime in on, you know, what are some key noticings in this image? And, and how does this image relate to education? So the context behind this image, this is an image um, from the late 1970s at a park in the Bronx, New York. Um, so this is around during the initial conception of hip hop to give you some context um, of this image. So, you know, what do we see in this image and how does this, how can this relate to education? And do you want people to, to type in different things that like they see? Yeah, absolutely. We can go there. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if you're, if you're an audience member and you want to type something in, I'll, I'll field it to Dr. Adjapong for you. Great. So about, about a minute or so, two minutes. Yeah. In the meantime, tell us something, uh, tell us a joke or something. A joke. Um, <laughs> or, no, I mean, anything about yourself that you'd like to share. Uh, I'm exhausted. I've been traveling. I went to Ghana, West Africa for a couple of days and I just got back on Saturday and I'm still not adjusted to the time. So I'm yeah. ahead of everybody, but excited to be back um and I'm, I'm just i'm excited i, I go i get to teach my hip-hop class again this semester so do you get an awesome response with this hip-hop class like are like i i could see that this going over in the sense that like uh there's you have a wait list yeah yeah it's um this is the second time i've taught it the first time was you know it was getting the feelers out but this time it's like i have probably triple amount of students in there and um it's, 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 an, it's an amazing class. And what I love about this class in particular is that, you know, I get students from all across the campus to have conversations about hip hop and education, right? So I have students who are not even, who are not particularly going to become teachers. Um, and it's cool to kind of spark their minds and see like how they can participate in their community, even if they're not going to be an educator and, you know, how they can contribute to schools and, and teaching and learning. So that's a beautiful Yeah, that's part. pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, that's a great part. And then, you know, everybody just connects through hip hop, so. I, I would sign up for it. I can tell you that. One more time. I would sign up for that class. Oh, uh, maybe I can do it virtually one day. Yeah, that actually sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, what time? I don't want to take too much time on this, but um, I see Darren. Um, yeah, so he says it looks old school on a playground at a school. And then Dennis also said some artists are doing the technical work before a performance. Yes, those are two great um, noticings. Um, so we think about schooling, right? So <clears throat> you look at this image, you see a bunch of men working together. Um, and there's a woman, there's a woman back there. Always want to highlight women in particular in hip hop because women are not, um, often at the front lines of hip hop or, or given enough props and recognition. So men and women here working together, trying to figure something out, right? I see turntables there. So it looks like there's some DJ equipment, a lot of wires. I see a fan. 
um, I, I, I use this image a lot in my talks because it just, it just, it just, it demonstrates the creativity and innovation around the, con the inception of hip hop. So like we have a fan there because we don't want the, the equipment to overheat, right? And like somebody's figured that out along the way. The first time these, these, anybody set this, this kind of setup together, nobody, I don't think anybody was thinking about, you know, the equipment overheating. Um, we think about the electric electricity, like this is in a park. Nobody's nobody's mother is letting them use their electricity from their household. So this is most more than likely powered through a, a street lamp. Um, so how do you get the wiring to get the actual connection between the street lamp and, and the outlets for this? You know, I'm not sure how they did that, but I'm sure it took a lot of trial and error. So a lot of innovation, collaboration, there's a lot of STEM here in this image, right? A lot of STEM and engineering, because ultimately these 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 young men and, and women want to kind of reach a goal and that's to kind of put on a block party um, for the community. And this is this is this was what's happening. This is what hip hop looked like in the late 1970s in the Bronx um, and across New York City. Because in the 70s in New York City it was a kind of an economic um, there was a kind of economic um, situation with where a lot of folks who didn't have the resources were forced to stay in the communities and those who had the resources fled, um, went to the suburbs, etc. So folks in the community just try to find some opportunities to just have some fun, right? And, and spend time and, and gather the community together in, in some nonviolent ways. And this is one of the ways, and this is kind of how hip hop kind of was, con was conceived. Um, so I love showing this image because there are a lot of connections to, to teaching and learning, right? In order to, to, to learn and we need to collaborate. I always tell my young people that it takes, oftentimes it's better than one mind than, than multiple to work on a problem or work on a situation to try to figure things out a lot of trial and tri tribulation here. We have the scientific um, method, I'm sure, being used here. Um, maybe not linearly, but like we're, we're experimenting here. And that's the beauty of hip hop. And that's when the connection between hip hop and, and STEM. So when I, when I, do, I do a lot of my talks, I, I like to start off with a quote. <clears throat> and today we're gonna talk about hip hop as a genre of music, but also as a culture. We're gonna focus on hip hop as a culture um, today. And this quote is from Junot Diaz. If you want to make a human being a monster, deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. So, like I said earlier, I come to this work um, based on my personal experiences. So this is an image of my seventh grade teaching, this teaching staff in my school when I was in the seventh grade. So I grew up in the Bronx, and when I was in the sixth grade, I was uh, I was identified as, as a gifted and talented student. And what that meant was I was no longer encouraged to go to the school in my neighborhood that was literally down the block from my house. Um, and rather, um, the school district wanted to send me to a, a, a school for gifted and talented students, but that was not inside, in, in my, within my community. So I had to get on the bus at, a, at like maybe like what, 11 years old, get on a city bus and travel about an hour north into a, a predominantly white neighborhood in the Bronx where most of the gifted and talented students were. And I just didn't feel a connection. <clears throat> there. And oftentimes when I talk to people, you know, and I, and I show this image, you know, people say, you know, if they ask me the question is, you know, is it because my teacher, many of my teachers were white, is that why I didn't feel in a connection? And I was like, no, that's not the, that's not the, the, the answer that the, the problem I didn't, the reason why I didn't feel connection is because, <clears throat> excuse me, is because my teachers, I feel like my teachers didn't really do much to connect to my culture. Um, they weren't culturally relevant. They didn't really try to figure out who I was in a sense to teach me, especially as it came to science content. Like I remember when I think about my middle school science classes, I was just copying notes off of a board for most of the time. So there wasn't opportunities to be creative. There wasn't opportunities to collaborate. I wasn't really talking to my peers. Um, it was more so like, this is the content that you need to memorize, memorize it, and we'll move on. So at that point, you know, I kind of just really disengaged from school and, and from science in particular. And I was a student who had a lot of, you know, I was just one of those kids who was just super curious about the world. And I was always asking my mom all these scientific questions that she couldn't help me figure out. So I, I thought I'd get the answers in school, but that wasn't the case either. So, you know, when I think about STEM and students' interest in STEM, especially as we, were, we, we talk about urban youth, um, which is the kind of population that I, that I focus on, um, there's been a, a decrease um, of, interest as it relates to STEM, and particularly around African-American um, students. Um, a lot of students in general, a lot of students of color in general may envision the field of science as distant and inaccessible. And when I, when, you, when I do research around this topic in particular, you know, I ask students, you know, how many scientists do you have in your communities? 
And many students would raise their hand and say, none. And I'll ask them, you know, how many of your family work, work in healthcare? Or how many of your family, you know, are engine, you know, maybe work for the bus, uh, the trans and the MTA in New York City, et cetera. And I, you know, these pe these folks are scientists and they're engineers in, in a way. And that kind of sparks something in these young people's minds because they don't when young people think about science, they're really thinking about Einstein or somebody like Einstein who looks like Einstein, who can just like mix chemicals up and make them explode. Um, in particular, ele like elementary and middle school students in particular. Um, so for me, it's important to recognize, like, why is there a lack of interest in STEM um, when when in, in our in our in our society right now in our country, like a lot of STEM jobs are becoming ready, readily available for our young people to to explore and participate in. But oftentimes we're, we're recruiting people from overseas to fulfill those jobs and those requirements. So it's important for me um, to try to get young people to, to see themselves as scientists. Right. Um, there's an achievement depth in science, right? United States Department, so we're falling behind internationally in both math mathematics and science, we know this. And while STEM occupations have, they grew 17% from in the last 10 years or so. But given these, these statistics, African-American students' interest in STEM has, has still decreased and continues to do so. So that's something that, this is where I kind of think, started thinking about a framework for hip hop pedagogy and how to in increase interest in science and in STEM in particular. Um, when we look at um, the statistics around uh, achievement in science, when we look at grades four and eight, uh, we notice that you know, when we look at black students compared to white students, it's a 14% gap in the fourth grade. And when they get to the eighth grade, that gap kind of widens to 17.4%. Same thing with Latino students and when white compared to white students, there's a 12.5 gap in the fourth grade. And that kind of, that widens a little bit to 13.9. So as time goes on, while, while young people are in schools, um, achievement as it relates to science um, is decreasing, which is a problem. So the question is, if we recognize that there, there are achievement gaps, achievement depths, and, and lack of achievement in science and in STEM amongst, um, amongst all students, but in particular Black and Latino students, then what can we do? And this is where I thought, you know, wow, you know, how do we, how about we think about hip hop in schools and how can we bring hip hop into our classrooms to just make this connection kind of deeper and, and increase um, engagement amongst our students. So when we think about hip hop, I, I like to come to this work through the, the history of hip hop. So hip hop has five creative elements. Um, many people know about four, a lot of people don't con con consider knowledge a fifth element, but in my research, I consider knowledge a fifth element because I think it's one of the most important. So we have the MC, which is kind of the rapper um, who is like, you know, delivering the, the rap content, so have you. We have the B-boy, the dancing aspect of hip hop, the graffiti artist, the graffiti visual arts aspect of hip hop, the DJ, and this is what I, I identify as a technological aspect of hip hop. And last but not least, you have Nod to Self, which is kind of the, the social justice wing of, of hip hop. And all these creative elements, um, were created around and, and you can pinpoint them to the conceptions of hip hop and there you know there are other scholars and other people who, who say that there are other elements but i always argue that any other element can can be branched off of any of these three main elements so at this core three these are the creative elements of hip hop um and and my framework kind of aligns itself with the creative elements so when we think about hip hop and education um generally a lot of research has been published around what hip hop based education is, right? So hip hop based education is essentially, you know, utilizing hip hop, maybe song, maybe lyric into the into our curriculum. So for example, if you're in an English class, you know, we might we might look at um, Tupac's A Rose Who Grew From Concrete poem and analyze that. You know, that's hip hop based education. Or we might analyze a song and make connections and comparisons between a song um, and maybe literature. Um, but I want to take my research and extend it from what hip hop based education is and, and come up with a, a framework for hip hop pedagogy, which I identify as, as, a, as a way of authentically incorporating the elements of hip hop into teaching classroom culture and inviting students to have a connection with the content while meeting students on their cultural turf and teaching to their realities and experiences. So essentially hip hop pedagogy is not, 
it's a it's a framework right that that comes from and I'll go into more details in a bit in a, in a minute but it comes from the the history and the elements of of of, of hip hop um and it's about how do we utilize these 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 this framework within our daily teaching strategies as opposed to just giving off one off assignments here and there um how can we you, you and how can as educators us how can we teach hip using a hip hop pedagogy on a daily and consistent basis? It's, and that's what, what's needed in our, in our classrooms across our nation. So now I'm gonna go through my framework for hip hop pedagogy. I'm kind of going through this kind of quickly. So um, I just wanna have time for everything. So if there are any questions, you know, feel free to ask like towards the end. Okay. Cool, are we good? Yeah, that sounds good. All right. So hip hop pedagogy. Um, I came up with this this pedagogy or this framework um, while at a J. Cole concert. So I'm a huge J. Cole fan. And like, there are not many artists that can, hip hop artists right now, that can really control a crowd, I would say, by themselves. Um, I say J. Cole's a great one. I will say Travis Scott is another great one, um, who are like really contemporary hip hop artists right now who can really rock kind of a stadium, a crowd of maybe like 10, 10,000, 5, 10,000 plus. So I'm at a J. Cole concert and like, in one of these moments, this is Forest Hills concert, um, Forest Hill Drives concert, and I've been to this this concert about two or three times, and because I've been there and I know that I know the set, you know, there's a part in the concert where J Cole's like, everybody, you know, put your hands up and wave side to side. I'm like, you know what, J Cole, I spent a lot of money coming here, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, I know, I know what you, I know what you're trying to do, but. You know, in that moment, I, I just stood there and I watched everybody and I watched how this one person can captivate an audience of thousands of people. Um, and I'm thinking about how can we get a teacher to do that in a classroom of 30, right? So how can we leverage hip hop as, and, and think about how can we engage our students while, while utilizing hip hop? And you know, about two minutes into it, my arms were in the air as well, right? So he got me again, but it's just like kind of this, like this, 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 this energy that you feel when you're amongst people who are connected through this music or through this content um, that gets everybody kind of on the same wavelength. And, and this is something that we have to kind of like explore a little further, a little deeper. And that's kind of what I try to do in, with hip hop pedagogy. So when we think about hip hop pedagogy, um, the first element is the MC. So the rapper on stage, right? And oftentimes when we go to concerts and we see hip hop artists on stage, there's never an artist on stage by themselves or, or seldom, very often, right? So when we think about the MC, we think about how can we empower, number one, how can we like get students to co-teach, right? If there are two artists on stage, like this is Jay-Z and Kanye West, right? Or we think about Jay-Z and Memphis Bleak. So Jay-Z is the master of content and Memphis Bleak would be his hype man or hype, his hype man to help him out, fill in the gaps where you know, he's taking a breath or what have you. But what does that look like in our classrooms? Right. So and when we think about co-teaching and kind of like, you know, this is from um, Dr. Emden's work around co-teaching, you know, how do we empower young people to be the co-teacher outside of the, the traditional co-teacher who's in, a, in an ICT class or in a class where we have students with, with, with 503s and modifications. Right. But how do we empower a student to be a co-teacher? Um, and a, a student being a co-teacher needs to know the content just as well as the actual teacher. So what this can look like in many classrooms is, you know, maybe a day before a lesson, you, I, I would always ask my students, you know, we, we had like protocols for all this stuff, but you know, who wants to co-teach tomorrow or, or next week? And a couple of days prior to that co-teaching, you know, I would sit with that student, I would give them my lesson plan and I'll have them take it. They'll, they'll learn it. Um, they'll learn the content and it'll probably, it's not brand new content, but it's content that they're familiar with, but they're just going to engage the classroom on their own. And I would just, when it's time for that student to teach, I'll just sit in the seat of that student and allow that student to be at the helm. And, and, what, this, and what I've seen this do to students is it empowers them. Um, and it also gives, it also makes them want to learn the content and want to be a master of that content. But more importantly, it, it, from a teacher perspective, I can learn how that student is teaching this content to their students, right? So what analogies are they using? You know, how are they, how are they moving their hands? Um, how are they calling on students? Because, you know, I think our students are also are very privy to a lot of things in our classrooms that we are not. So how do we empower our young people to kind of take the helm of the classroom while we're kind of just sitting in the back and being a co-teacher for that moment as well? When we think about the MC, we think about call and response. So when you go to concerts, you know, our artists might say, you know, when I say, hey, you say, ho, 
or what have you. They'll, they have maybe many different types of call and response, but what does call and response or what can call and response look like in our classrooms, right? And in my science classroom, when they were like, when they were um, vocabulary terms or science terms that I want my students to really hold on to, I would create call and responses for them, right? So for Newton's laws of motion, I would say, you know, an object at rest, you know, and the, stu the student's re response stays at rest. And that would be our call and response. And uh, an object in motion, the, the student's response stays in motion, right? <clears throat> and I would do this many times throughout a class period. And, 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 and this helps because number one, students may feel comfortable, may not feel comfortable doing it on their own, but they may feel comfortable doing it as a, as an, as a class. Number two, students may not, under, may not understand the, the response or may not know the, the call and response. So if you do this multiple times during your class period, it gives them a student multiple opportunities to participate and find their way in. If students are absent, the same, right? So call and response around definitions, around like really challenging words to, to, um, to articulate for students um, was always a, a very important for me in our classroom. And I you know, try to do it through a hip hop mannerism as well, just so the students can see the connections themselves. So that's the MC. When we move towards break, b-boying and break dancing. Um, when you talk about b-boying and break dancing, it's the little gift here. The, the, the idea of like, you know, how can, you know, dancers and young people just manipulate their bodies and, and, and create all these amazing dance moves in a really, in a competitive spirit, right? And when I when I, I realized this, I, you know, I, I was in, I, I would sit around in school and talk to my students and say, you know, what's one thing you didn't like about school? And they would say we we're, we sit down all the time, you know, and, and the only time we get to move is when we're going from class to class. So I'm thinking, you know, how can we create more opportunities for students to to engage in kinesthetic learning, right, or breaking, so have you, right? So, you know, how, and how do we connect the kinesthetic learning to the content? So thinking about all these dances that have evolved over time is seeing how we incorporate movement in our classrooms and it through a, a bunch of different ways like we talk about modeling in the science and stem classroom a lot um one way i did this was when we talked about the different states of matter you know i, I recognized that my students are having a really difficult time thinking about molecules and how molecules would move from gas to solid and vice versa solid liquid to gas and i would tell my students you know we're all molecules, everybody stand behind your chair with molecules. So each one of you is a molecule. And I say, now the entire class is a solid, right? You are composed of solid molecules. And all the students will get up and they'll move to the corner of the classroom and then they will stand in a, in a structure, right? And they will, they will resemble um, the structure of a solid. And not every student will participate, right? Some students will, will be standing to the side um, just observing, which is fine because they're learning because those are the students who probably don't have a full grasp of the content. And this is a great opportunity for them to learn through a different um, modality. So these students, my students will stand in the classroom in the corner and I'll ask them, you know, what's one thing that molecules are always doing? And they will say vibrate and they'll start like vibrating in place, right? And, and then I'll say you're a liquid and they'll still, they'll, they'll, you take, they, they take liquid, take the shape of the container. So they'll, they'll, they'll like kind of roll against the walls and, and put their bodies against the walls and and take the shape of the container. And then I'll say, you're a gas. And the students start running around the classroom or jogging around the classroom safely, um, re resembling gas molecules. But what this demonstrates, number one, is that you, know, that you can act out you know, how molecules interact with each other in, in different states of matter. But more importantly, it gave students who didn't have a full grasp of the content opportunity to see um, through their peers, how this happens. So it's another form of modeling. So how do we incorporate more kinesthetic and more opportunities for students to, to learn while seeing themselves as the content, essentially modeling the content. When we think about graffiti, the visual arts aspect of hip hop, um, we look at the visual, we think about like, how can we incorporate more drawing and, and again, more modeling and but more students creating their own models. I know when we, when we teach with models, oftentimes the teachers, you know, is up all night or the day before trying to get this perfect model together so they can show their students and demonstrate it with their students. But we need to put the learning in, our, in the hands of our students and allow our students to kind of fumble and make mistakes by, by creating their own models. So when we think about graffiti, the visual arts aspect of hip hop, right? Graffiti artists are, are brilliant, right? This is an image of Five Points, which used to be in Queens, but unfortunately was torn down. Um, but graffiti artists have to know about ratios right they can't like you if you see where it says five points here the five can't be super small and the z 
super big, right? There has to be ratios um, a, a, aligned with it. They have to know which paint to use, right? Um, so how do we get our students to create their own visual models of things that they can't conceptualize or they have a hard time concept conceptualizing? So I remember one time I was teaching the um, layers of the Earth's atmosphere and I had a student come up to me and say, Mr. When I look up in the sky, you know, I, I don't see the Earth's atmosphere. All I see um, is our, our clouds. And I'm like, you know, you're absolutely right. So then that kind of really pushed me to kind of create an activity where students can can model and draw out their own representation of the Earth's atmosphere. And I, I, I try to leave this as, this is a complete um, one, but one, the, the worksheet that I gave my students just had a picture of the Earth and it had a legend with, these are the things that the students need to, uh, needed to include. And I let them create their own um, symbols because it, I don't, you know, however you, however you think a plane is, however you think a meteorite looks, you know, you do that. But that helps the students remember and be able to recognize the different characteristics between the different layers, right? So having the students create their own models and, and visual representation of the content um, proved to be very important for students. And then give them a lot of time to, to engage in this work, right? Because, you know, oftentimes in our science classrooms, you know, it's either it's, it has to be focused on solely on content, but how do we become more interdisciplinary um, and put that learning in the hands of our students? So this is an example of like be utilizing visual art and graffiti within our classroom. And, and then once, there's, when this, once this is done, hang it up across the classroom, hang it up around the school, you know, maybe around the community. So, so people in the, in the community within the school recognize that the students are, are really working their, their, their behinds off doing this work and, and creating these, these beautiful visual representations of themselves. Um, the fourth element, the DJ. Um, the DJ is the, the, the person who kind of just keeps the mood of the classroom. Um, I know myself when I engage in work or when I'm studying or writing, I, I can't do it in silence. Um, and I remember talking to my students and I said, you know, when you go home and do your homework, you know, what's the context like? What's the environment like? And they say, you know, either my, my siblings are playing in the background, my mom or dad is watching TV. But for most of my students, nobody ever did anything in silence. So the idea is like, you know, how do we create that same environment in our classroom for students to be really engaged, right? So I, I really just wanted to, to, re, to create the, the home context inside of our classroom so students can feel more comfortable, right? And when I, when I first did this, um, so this is a playlist, like a YouTube playlist, um, student curated. And um, in the beginning of this, every marking period, I would switch up every marking period and have students write down a list of their favorite songs. And what will happen is when a student, when, like let's say, um, excuse me, there we go. When a student um, hears a song that, oh, sorry, when, when the classroom is like really like having a good time to one song or one instrumental, you know, that student who, who selected that song feels very good about themselves because they had the agency to pick that song. When I first started doing this, I, I used the, um, I didn't use instrumentals and I used the actual songs and it was a problem because the students, including myself, would just like rap along and sing along to the songs, but the instrumentals proved to be really um, impactful and useful because, you know, they just nod their heads, or just do their work. So I just like, you know, play this student curated playlist during like independent work times or maybe during group work times. Anytime when I wasn't speaking, there was music in the background of the classrooms. And this, this made students feel more comfortable in, in the classroom setting. And last but not least, when we have knowledge itself. So knowledge itself is kind of like the most, I would say, I would say it's the unforgotten element of hip hop. And, and knowledge itself really focuses on um, hip hop being a social justice kind of mechanism. You know, hip hop started in the, in the late 70s and it really came to, um, to the mainstream media through the song, The Message by um, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. And that song was powerful because it gave the world an opportunity to see, you know, how people in inner cities, inner cities look. It was the first song that wasn't about a party. It wasn't about having a good time, but it was, it was a politi social political song. So how do we create um, opportunities for young people to be social and political um, within our science classroom, right? And, and, and utilize their voice to push back against opp oppressive um, educational systems and structures um, and things that are happening within the community. So how do we create opportunities? So one thing I did was um, I created an assignment where I listed a bunch of different kind of disparities um, 
within our community. So it could be asthma, the asthma rates in the Bronx. It could be hypertension. It could be uh, climate change. And I had students work in groups. They selected, they selected a topic and they, they, their job was to go out and make others aware of the issues, of this issue. Right. So some students wrote a letter, the students of the climate change, they wrote a letter to their local um, politician about climate change and about around their stance and about how, you know, they're the next generation who's going to inherit this world's problems. Students who had asthma, remember, they asked and they wanted to go on the street um, on the sidewalk of the school and they, they created signs with um, facts around asthma and the asthma rates in our community. But how do we in encourage our students to be more active? Um, and political issues that, that they have, that, that affect them, number one, but also how do they make their, their communities aware of these issues? So knowledge itself is very important and it could, it could be done while engaging and learning in scientific issues. Um, so when we think about utilizing hip hop pedagogy, um, the goal, another goal of hip hop pedagogy is how do we create opportunities for, for young people to be better connected with the teacher and for the teacher to have a deeper understanding of the students, right? So this, this work comes from a, a social construct called Strong Ties and Weak Ties from Coleman. Um, and here on the left, I have, um, I argue that these are students of the hip hop generations and they have, they have strong ties amongst each other because they're, they come from the same, they're from the same generation, oftentimes from the same cultural background, they're kids, right? They get it, they know each other. And here, the weak tie is between the teacher Right, because a teacher is it's from a different generation, oftentimes is not from the same background of their students. Um, we have a weak tie here because you know the teacher does teach the students and we're in the same space, but that weak tie can develop into a strong tie. It could be better. So through hip hop pedagogy, that weak tie can turn into a strong tie. And the reason that weak tie can start turn into a strong tie is because the teacher is utilizing youth culture and hip hop culture as a as a way to engage their students. And in order to do this effectively, oftentimes it takes the teacher having to go to the students and asking them, who the students who are the experts on hip hop, how do I do this and how can I make this more effective? Because hip, the way hip hop looks in New York City is completely different than what it looks like in Houston, Atlanta, LA, et cetera, right? So I, I really wanna just you know say that this is a framework and that this looks differently in different settings and different spaces. And oftentimes we have to leverage our young people to help us engage in this type of work. Um, and that's the beauty of it, right? The same thing we talk about cultural capital, right? We have students of the hip hop generation um, and through utilizing hip hop pedagogy, um, there's an increased cultural capital around science because what I found in my research is that students through hip hop pedagogy, they, they were more inclined to, to wanna do better in science, to wanna learn science content. They just felt more comfortable. And if students feel more comfortable engaging in science in, the class, in their sixth grade classroom, they'll feel more encouraged to take a, an advanced placement science class if they're offered it in high school, um, et cetera, or maybe wanted to, you know, wanted to do a, a outside of school um, science elective. Um, but it, it gives students the motivation to want to do and want to participate and be scientists. And that's the beauty of the, of the cultural capital around science. All right. So essentially, um, in all my work, I say hip hop is, is currency. Hip hop as currency, like hip hop can be super important, super powerful for all young people, right? I know my work, I, I focus on predominantly black and Latino youth, but hip hop is the most consumed genre of music across the world, right? Everybody is, is participating in hip hop. So how can we leverage it in our schools, in our classrooms to make it, to, to for it to be a, a tool for engagement um, and to it, most importantly, increase achievement. Um, all right, let me skip this because we have about 15 minutes left. So now I want to get to the science genius portion of this, right? So the science genius program um, is a program that uh, Dr. Chris Emden and I started about eight years ago. And essentially, I, I jumped on before, a little bit before the keynote, and I saw some students um, having some rapping videos. And it's, that's essentially what we do. We go into science classrooms across New York City, and we're actually in, in different cities across the state, North America. We're in Jamaica. And we go into urban communities where students don't see themselves as scientists. And, and we use this program as a, as a tool to engage um, young people. And, and ultimately, the goal is to increase achievement um, as it relates to science. So um, I have a quick video. This is an NPR video. It's about five minutes. Um, and then I'll wrap up and just finally finish talking about what the Science Genius Program is and, and some of the results of it.
So that was um, this is NPR video. That was the first Science Gen's Battles um, in a long time, 2012, I believe. And we we partnered with JZA. So we had a, there was a, there were a bunch of stars, hip hop stars, and that's kind of how we draw the students in. And it's we draw the students in through hip hop, but then we bring them like you know what you're writing science raps. And we, we, we never seen students work so hard on, on anything before. And it's not about only the science. It, my cell is about the science achievement, which is very important to me, the science literacy. But this program really allows students to like kind of get out their shell and, and be able to perform on stage and take something very serious. Um, and it, they get to demonstrate their, their science content knowledge in, in front of their community. So it's a program that it starts off in the school where students is a competition. So students are, are working together collaboratively and ultimately, um, the competition be part begins where only one student per school is selected to be that science genius representative of their school. And they go on to compete against all the other schools in the city. Um, and we, we always have the, the, the final concert at Columbia University. So students come to our Ivy League institution, rapping science, science raps. And it's, it's just a beautiful thing to see just how inspired and motivated these young people are to number one win but more importantly, just demonstrate just how brilliant they are, you know, while, you know, after they learn the science content. Um, and I've seen students who barely came to school, who barely went to science class, go on and win this program and these, these science genius battles. And I think it's just remarkable. So we often have, um, we, we work with this program in a, a number of cities. We're in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. We're in Toronto, in Canada as well. We're in Jamaica. Um, we're in New York City, we're in Houston, and, and you know, we're, we're slowly expanding. Um, it's, it's really challenging because only a few of us do this work, but, you know, we have the students compete, you know, against, against one another. They, they write their science rhymes, they compete against one another, um, and there's always one winner. And when we, we interview the students about their experiences, we, 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 we recognize, like, what the outcomes of this, of this program you know, are, and, you know, some of the outcomes are, you know, it provided therapeutic space, um, a mental health outlet for students to just to share about what's going on in their communities and their families and their, in their minds. Um, they, they gain a deeper understanding of science content. It, they, they were able to connect the science content to their lived experiences. Um, it was a space to bring their emotional selves into the classroom. We saw increased attendance, increased engagement, and in, in all of our and all of our science amongst all of our science genius students, so you know we it's very difficult to to pick a winner, and we have a rubric for all of this stuff. So we're no we're not picking. Um, we have we always have celebrity we have about celeb some celebrity judges. Um, Derek Luke actor has been a, a big part of this work with us. Um, we always have, try to have at least a rapper either from the community, or as, if we can get our hands on somebody really big for the students like really be engaged. And then we have a science person. So the scientists um, come and we have those three folks who are, who are judging um, our, the, the students at the, at the final battles. And it's just a remarkable time. So just, you know, seeing like, you know, how kind of life-changing this, this program can be. And we have two students who are from our first science genius battles who are graduated from college this academic year who want to be teachers and want to go back in their, in their communities and do the same work um, that we've done with them. And, and that's kind of what this is all about. Right, like how do we increase achievement? How do we allow our young our young people to think and know that they can become scientists? Um, and just continue this cycle that all young people, regardless of where you come from, where you are, that you're brilliant, that you're a genius, and that you're capable um, of, of doing this in school. So um, that's it. I think that's that's all. That's the science genius battle. So I guess. Dr. Ajapong, you have a couple comments here, um, but some of them, I know John Chase actually wrote one of them. They've tried this a little bit over um, in yeah. England where he is, and he says that a lot of people agree that the teacher buy-in is definitely the, the yeah. key ingredient. Yeah, is yeah, yeah. A, is there a trick to it? Yeah, so for us, we, we've, we've, we've had a, a, a number of different models, right? So the first model was, you know, teachers are not the experts in hip hop and we brought a hip hop ambassador into the school. So it was a community member from the, from the a community, a hip hop community member, a local rapper or artist who came and was the, the person working with students. And we realized that that didn't work well because when the ambassador came into the classroom, the teacher would take a seat and like kind of take, you know, sit in the back and like, you know, this is not my class for the time, you know, teachers, I, teachers work very hard. 
I know. Yeah. Um, but that the goal of this was for the teacher and the ambassador to work collaboratively, like the ambassador being the, the, the leader of the, of the hip hop and the rapping side and the teacher being the leader of the science content side. But they, you know, and many times they didn't really work together. Um, so when you talk about teacher buy-in, we work in school, that, that's the most, we, want, we work with teachers who want this program in their, in their classrooms and, and school leaders who want this program in their schools. So now what we do is we have a, a professional development model where teachers are coming to Columbia about four times throughout the program, where they are being trained on how to in, uh, implement this program in their classroom. And when, we do, when we've done that, we've realized that it was such a big part um, that we were missing because the first, the first PD model, the first PD session, we had the te teachers write their own raps, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and you can't, and you can't ask your students to do something that you that you're not required to do, right? So it's all about show and prove, and it's really about like getting the teacher outside their comfort zone too, because the students are going to be outside their comfort zone, especially in New York, right? Where hip hop is such a, I mean, hip hop is a big thing everywhere, but in New York is something special, and the kids, you know, they they shy away from hip hop because they feel like they're not good enough. Right. So if the teachers, yeah. if the teachers are able to go out there and you know, semi make a fool of themselves and, and be comfortable with it, they can model that for their kids. It's right? almost like a transformation of the person. Yeah, not, absolutely. Not not just the accomplishment of a task or an assignment. I successfully, I think, mm -hmm. uh, just wrote my first like rap, and Ooh. I felt like I was superhuman. It was so much more difficult than yes. than writing to to a different genre. Like yes. I and felt. I felt so accomplished when I was done. I was very proud. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, I think that, that's the part. I mean, I, I didn't hit on that part much today, but that's the part that a lot of folks who like kind of listen to, into this work and haven't really practiced it, they would say, oh, writing a rap is easy. Writing a rap is very, very difficult, especially writing one that makes sense and that includes content. Yeah. Because you have to have a deep understanding of the content in order for it to make sense. Then you have to think about metaphors, analogies, you know, um, are you going to rhyme within the within the within the, the stanza? Are you going to rhyme at the end, right? Um, how are you going to make it engaging? How are you going to make it fun, right? So there are a lot of pieces that go into it, and that's why our students have to know the content. And the students, in order when, while they're writing their raps, I'm, I've seen students go home and go, on, go online and and research content that's not even part of the curriculum, mm. just to have an edge on other students. I and mean, that's the <laughs> of this program. That's right? perfect. That's yeah, great. You know, it's it's about science. It's about hip hop. It's also about competition like friendly yeah. competition and how do we harness that and anchor that within our schools and yeah college. to make to make the best product that's out there absolutely and we just want our students to be the best that's all you have um two questions one is has the diversity of staff in large cities begun to mirror that of the community that they represent no okay <laughs> no um we're still that that's the issue that, that we're still working with even new york city right even the bronx where the bronx is I think the Bronx is about 65% Latino right now. Uh, the teaching task, the teaching force is, does not represent that. Um, and, and this is why we have to train our teachers, right? So it, when I talked about like the, 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 the excuse me, the, the strong ties and weak ties, right? It, it's also important to recognize that many teachers who want to engage in this work do not come from a hip hop background, right? And that's important to recognize. But I always tell, I tell everybody, I think hip hop is, I, I argue that hip hop is a culture and that hip hop is one of the most inclusive cultures, right? And that if if you want to be a part of hip hop, there's a space there for you. But if you're not, if you if you didn't grow up hip hop, if you weren't kind of grew, if you didn't grow up in this culture, you have to kind of take a seat as a as a learner to learn from those who have, right? And sometimes that's that's the teacher learning from the students and asking the students questions about how do I do this in my classroom or what do you think works best for you. So it really provides opportunities for teachers and students to really engage in authentic conversations. Mm -hmm. around teaching and learning what that looks like effectively in the classrooms and that takes some guts you know yeah. as a as yeah. a public ed teacher to sit down and, and to talk to your students to ask them how you can do your job better yeah you know it's about right yeah you know, absolutely if you were taught if you were at the doctor's office right and you have some feedback from your doc for your doctor you you would want to give it to them right yeah um but oftentimes when we think about schools um it's not that's not the case with teachers so you have another question here. It says, um, did the NPR documentary help convince any of the teachers? Yeah, it, it, it goes a long way. Um, and plus we have a lot, we have a bunch of research articles that I, I can share with you, Tiffany. I mean, if, if you just Google, you know, my name and Science Genius, uh, a lot of research articles will come. There's a lot of research we've done around this, around this work. 
And at this point in New York City, everybody knows that it's, it works. Now we're in, this, in, the, in, the, in the conversations of, of sharing it with, with people across um, other cities and with, um, with uh, like grant organizations at this point. But, you know, the, and I guess, you know, all the media that we get around it, it, it helps with the validity, the validity of the work. Um, but just like you got to come to the you got to come to one of our shows and see the kids and talk to the kids, right? I would no, love to. No coaching, no nothing. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I would and, love to come. Yeah, yeah. Our next conference we have it at, during our hip hop ed conference. We're having our fourth annual conference. It'll be like I think the first Saturday in June. So mark your calendars and we'll we'll promote it within the okay. Next month or so first yeah. Saturday in June. I'll write that down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then John, um, who's actually over in England. Um, mm -hmm. He asked, he says, uh, it's, it's multi-curricular too. Sometimes it's done in English class, other times in music, other times in science. Um, can, uh, can this approach basically be used as transferable skills into other disciplines? Absolutely. So my argument for hip hop pedagogy is that, I mean, I created a science class, I'm a science guy. So I created a science class and that's kind of where it's rooted. Um, but hip hop pedagogy can, it works effectively in, in, across all content areas. It's, it's really a, a, an approach to teaching and learning. And it's not content specific. And even though the 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 um the rap piece, the the writing rhymes piece, it 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 looks the same in in all other content areas. But just right now, we're focusing on science, and we're we're gonna really try to explore and expand to other content areas in the future. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. We were honored to have you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, and I hope you know we all learned and, and grew from this. And if anybody has any further questions or wants to engage in any dialogue. Definitely feel free to contact me on Twitter. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Adjapong. It's been a pleasure. Um, we're lucky to have you, and uh, we hope that you might collaborate with Voices. We'd love to promote your conference in June if you send us a link, and uh, we'll put it out there. Will do. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks for your time.